This masterclass is in association with the photography design discipline. I would like to I, I would like to invite the discipline lead Saurabh Sri Vastava to introduce the speaker. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I think this is one of the toughest tasks which is given to me to introduce somebody who doesn't need any introduction, right? It's very difficult then. But as the responsibility is given to me, I feel honored, you know, to perform this duty. Uh, Danita Singh uh, uses photography to reflect and expand on the ways in which we relate to images. Her recent works drawn from her extensive photographic work uh, are a series of mobile museums that allow her images to be edited, sequenced, archived, and displayed. Stemming from Danita's interest in the archive, the museum present her photographs as interconnected bodies of work uh, that are replayed with both poetic and narrative possibilities. Publishing, Publishing is also, oh. yeah, no, that's okay. Publishing is also an signif a significant part of artist's practice. In her books, often published without text, uh, Danita extends her experiments to alternate forms of uh, producing and viewing photographs. Danita is a Hazelbrecht Laureate 2022, for 2022, uh, the first, the first South, South Asian. South okay, that echo adds the value. Thank you. <laughs> the first South Asian to be conferred this honor. Great. This is a great achievement. Uh, great, so thank you for accepting our invitation, Dayanita, and I would like to invite you on the dais for you know, further proceedings. Please, thank you. It's a great privilege to be in this auditorium on the dais, the same auditorium where 42 years ago, Ashok Chatterjee welcomed us all and made the mistake of calling us the creme de la creme of Indian society. And I think that was a problem, but anyway, this is where it started. And I'm especially excited to be here because this is where Nalin Pandya, whose film we saw on Monday, used to run this amazing film club. So, you know, this is the room where we discovered Tarkovsky, Fellini, Agnes Varda, Stalker that just blew everybody's minds away. And all of that and more from NID and Ahmedabad, I hope to share with you in this presentation. And I'm very grateful to my friends who've come sitting in that corner all together. And many of you will be future friends. But most of all, I'm really grateful to Rishi Singhal for somehow winging this and making it happen. I've waited many years to come to be invited to NID. And while there was big successes everywhere else, when there was something happening here, I would see, hmm, strange, I'm not on that list. Um, so thank you very much, Rishi. And thank you, Amar, and thanks, Amar Nath, and thank you, Saurabh. Um, Great privilege to be here. So since I'm in a film festival, I thought I would cheat a little bit and actually show you a film. And it's a work in progress. I ha myself have not seen it uh, projected. It is this thing for years I've been struggling with how to turn stills into movie. And we have all kinds of uh, you know, great um, masters who have done this before us. But anyway, this is, this is a little film that I've tried to make uh, on my friend Mona Ahmed. So we'll start, we'll start with the film. So that's my wonderful Mona, the best, my best friend really. Uh, sometimes my mother, sometimes my daughter, sometimes my lover, sometimes my friend. It's very hard for me to try to talk about the relationship I had with Mona. Anyway, we made this book in 2001. It was called Myself, Mona Ahmed. 
I hope it's in the library. Uh, I thought I would not do a linear presentation, but since it's 40 years since I've uh, been doing this and since I've been here, I thought I would take you through s some of the aspects of my work where I can very directly see the influence of NID, of Ahmedabad, of the people I knew in Ahmedabad, my local guardian, Kumudani Lakhia, the architecture of this building. But most of all, I think the most influential thing for me uh, has been the design process course that we did with Mohan Bhandari. That was really life changing. Uh, a year and a half of studying with Mohan Bhandari. Um, sort of your mind blown every day. And if you're coming like all of us were, uh, straight from school and from fairly, uh, you know, traditional conservative homes. There was the shock of the architecture and there was the shock of the thought um, that this place sort of um, provoked in you all the time. It was full of provocations and we had wonderful visiting faculty. So I think my time at NID started with design process. Uh, with Mohan Bhandari. And then as I decided to specialize in visual communication, uh, Vikas Satvalekar became not just my guide, but really my biggest support. Because at that time, there was no photography at NID, no specialization in photography. And I had come here because I was very interested in becoming a type designer. I was very influenced by Satyajit Ray's way of writing English. And I thought, why can't we have more um, Indian English type faces? And that's what I wanted to do. And uh, But then I had the, everybody I'm sure knows the story about how I became a photographer. But basically, it was a way to buy my freedom and to not have to get married, not have to have children. And so it was, oh, Shadi to karao, and I would say, nahi, I can't because I'm a photographer. And sweet, gullible relatives would say, oh, poor thing. You know? So I built a whole scenario for myself because at that time there were no women in photography. NID had no specialization. So I must admit that by the first year I had realized I want to be a photographer, but I was still learning a lot from NID, so there was no question of leaving. And by third year, fourth year, the faculty, and my mother reminded me this, I had forgotten. Uh, especially in the fifth year, she said, when I was getting to my book design course where I made a book on Zakir Hussain, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the faculty at NID said, you know, we have spent a lot of time educating you to be a visual communicator. Your parents have spent a lot of money. And what is this photography that you now want to do? You know, that is not suitable for someone from NID. And my mother reminds me, I told them, I said, you don't worry, just wait and see what I will do. And one day I will come and be teaching photography in this very institute. Well, I'm not teaching, but there's a little lecture today. So I'm very pleased with myself. And most of the faculty are not here. I really, I really wish and miss Vikas very much, because I think he would have come here and held my hand and you know cheered for me. Um, but yeah, really, my time at NID started with Mohan Bhandari and end with, ended with uh, Vikas Satwalekar, somehow very, very supportive of me. Um, and I'm very happy to be here just after having opened a retrospective of 40 years of my work in uh, Berlin and Munich and getting this Hasselblad Award. Um, it sort of feels like the right time to come back to NID where there's possibly not much of a discussion on whether I should have become a photographer or not. Having said that, I don't call myself a photographer. For me, photographs are raw material. And for me, it's all about what you do with the image, what you do with the raw material. Just understanding all the notes in a rag doesn't make you a musician. Um, so similarly, you have to know how what you do with that raw material. It's not enough to put that out on a stage or any platform. So this is the retrospective. And there's Mona at the back. Uh, in front is my time measures work. And there's a video co called Mona and Myself, which is just Mona listening to a song. And then inside, you see my newest work, 
the latest work, which is called Let's See, which is something I developed with the idea of contact sheets, because during COVID, I had a lot of time to look at my contact sheets. And now when I come back to an ID and I look at my word, the dark word and the black frames, I mean, it's, it's the same color scheme of this auditorium, you know? So it's amazing how much we get shaped by aesthetic. And the aesthetic of NID, I think, has had a huge impact on me. And the grid in the, I don't know what you call it now, the passage, um, that I think that grid just got imprinted in my head. But then also there's Sanskar Kendra and Tagore Hall and sort of trips to Sept quite often to meet someone or the other. Um, so the architecture became a big, big part of NID as well, apart from all the teaching. And I think being able to design the kind of structures I've been able to make would not have been possible without this kind of training where we had a little bit of textiles, a little bit of product, ceramic, exhibition. And I'm, I'm very impatient with my photography colleagues because they don't understand fonts, they don't understand book design, they don't understand exhibition design, till my friend Rukmini reminded me that I had NID and very other, few, very not any other photographer of my vintage had that experience. And now I see what she means. Because had I gone to just a photography school or an art school, I think I would not be working the way I'm going to be showing you right now. So I think I really got the best of NID and then was able to uh, funnel it into what I wanted to do as an artist. So these days I call myself an offset artist. But anyway, this is Let's See, and these are these giant contact sheets where you can slide images out from one side and into the other side. So it's a constantly changing contact sheet. And this is a book that I just published earlier this year. It's called Let's See. I don't have any copies with me, but it's available on Amazon. And this is my idea of a photo novel. I'm very interested in finding other forms for photography, but then other forms for the book as well. And why should a book of photos be like a Steidl book, very pristine, uh, each image? And instead, I wanted to have very much this idea of a sequence from my very early work. And this book is really a tribute to the archive. Thank God I shot on film. I couldn't delete anything. And so during COVID, when I went into my, all my contact sheets, I was amazed at the images I found. Really, I urge all of you to look at this book to see what a fine photographer I was until I became a photographer. You know, it was because at that time, I was photographing just as a way of having the conversation, continuing the conversation. These are like little, like making rubbings of something that you like very much, like a caress. They're not Dainita Singh photographs. And therefore, I had the idea to try and turn them into a novel. And of course, uh, the idea of a photo novel and somehow taking the photoness away from photography. So I do that partly by putting the gutter in the middle of the book but also the way it's printed on text paper. And so my brief to Steidl was that I want to make a book that doesn't look like a Steidl book. And yet, it has to create a new genre, which is going to force people to read the images and not just look at them. So here's, let's see. This is my hostel room um, after I had made a lot of contact sheets. And I think GU's furniture and those windows, you know, I, do you still have them, those slatted windows? Um, all of that was also a big influence, the folding chairs. <coughs> Sorry. My roommate, Yamuna, who was my roommate for six years, um, there were a lot of parties in our room. Uh, Amar, Amar, Rajan, and Nalin were three very important men who we sat one night to decide whether I should become a photographer or not. Um, and so they were there with me, supporting me, and saying, you know, you can't really worry about what people are going to say. Just go ahead and do it. And so overnight, I decided that I was going to be a photographer. I'm not going to get into the Zakir Hussain story here. Um, again, 
I don't know how hostile life is now. I don't know if one can even photograph like that anymore because in those days, people were not conscious of the camera and I was not conscious of being a photographer. This, so this is how we used to hang out in the evenings. I wish some of my batchmates were here. Uh, Satish Gokhale, Shalmali Guttal, Kajri Jain on the right, and we'll end with Kajri Jain later in the talk, because Kajri Jain has gone on to write what I consider to be the single most critical essay on my work. So that's interesting that a batchmate, after all these years, should be the one who really does a thorough critique of my work. Um, this is a book the Zakir Hussain book that I made while I was a student at NID. So this was published in 1986. Um, I wrote the text myself. I did interviews and typeset it in Optima. Vikas was my guide, tried to get Zakir to write uh, some comments for the photos. And because I didn't really have an idea of uh, what a photo book should be, I just made my own rules, which was to say there are no rules. Um, and then in 2019, when Steidl saw, Steidl is this great publisher in Germany who I work with and who is really like a collaborator of mine. I, just like I talk about NID, there are, there's Zakir Hussain, there's Mona Ahmed, there's Steidl, people who really made, made it possible for me to be standing here today and make this presentation to you and do the work that I do. So when Steidl saw my maquette, which is here in the NID library, um, he said, we have to publish this so people know what a maquette is, what we call a dummy. And so we made this book with a sleeve, with, these, with the book, with a reader, which has my diary from NID, and the black thing becomes a poster. And this is how I had made my dummy for NID, which is what Gerhard wanted to reprint. And it was reprinted exactly like this with all the rubber solution marks. And in those days, we used to cut images of the exact size that we needed. Um, so I hand wrote this text. And these are pages from my, um, from the diaries we all, I don't know if you still get them, these lovely spiral bound notebooks at NID. <coughs> Does anyone have a VIX or something in the audience? No, no, no. It's just some things in my throat. Can you bring it here or shall I come to you? And then with the Zakir Hussain maquette, I was able to convince Steidl to let me make a book that would be a complete exhibition. So this is the same book. So if you want to show the Zakir Hussain work, you just have to buy, thanks a lot. You just have to buy four copies of the Zakir Hussain maquette, or 44, as many as you like. And on the left-hand side is the book clip to the wall. Then the sleeve on the cover is the introduction. Then the poster, then the reader. And what I don't have in this picture is the back of the book, which talks about book building. So by this time, I was very I had convinced Gerhard that we can have the possibility of making books that also become exhibitions. And that has gone on to be, I think, what I, am, what I have done, what I have achieved, what I got this award for. So now at the Gropius Bau, at this retrospective, it is very, very satisfying for me because at least a third of that retrospective has books on the wall, offset printed books on the wall, not just prints behind frame and glass. So this is something, from the very start, the book was the work for me. In fact, I came to photography via the book. So I basically, when I made that Zakir Hussain book at NID, I knew what I wanted to do with photography. It just took me another 20 years to have the confidence to say I'm a book artist. But I had already known that and then I had to follow the route of the art gallery and prints and frames and editions. So the exhibition came much after the book and felt to me like the catalogue of the book. So the book was the work and the exhibition felt like a catalogue. I always wondered why I could not have the book on the wall, the full symphony instead of single notes. 
Everyone said the book is the book and the exhibition is the exhibition. Do not mix the two. That became my clue and that's what I'm going to show you. So in 2007, I made this box called Center Letter, which title, and then it was my goal to have my photographs be selling on the footpath in Calcutta outside the India Museum. You know, I thought if there was any credibility to my work, then it should be mass produced. However, I went to Sivakasi with my color work and they rejected me, but we made one calendar. So this is in Calcutta, 2008, January. I put center letter, which is these seven accordion fold books, into the vitrines of Satram Das Jewelers, 2008. And it stayed there for 10 years. Those of you from Calcutta will know what a busy street it is and that Fleury's part. So at least 10,000 people walk past. So this became very important to me that I find ways of making my exhibitions away from the gallery and away from the institution. And the book allows for that kind of democratic way of working. And this is where I was very keen to take photography. And then I could travel with this box, and this is at the Ganges View in Varanasi, and Shashank Pai would say, kya kaam lai ho, koi projection lai ho, and I would say, nay, this, this time I've got an exhibition. And so we put all these out on different tables, and that becomes the exhibition. This is at the Photo Museum in Winterthur, where I started to say to people, if you want my work, you have to show the book. So I arm um, twisted everybody into showing the book, and look where we are today. Um, so this is some beautiful vitrines that Ushtahl actually made for this book. And then this is at the National Museum. It was my dream to show center letter at the National Museum. This is on the third floor near the toilets with the sort of sculptures that nobody wants to see. And my center letter was displayed there in these vitrines that I made. And then I have these images together because center letter then grew into Museum of Chance. Now, center letter box, the construction of it, I wish I had the copy. I understand it is missing from the library. Um, so somebody is sitting on it, which is not very nice. Um, the boxes were made in India. And I constructed the box myself. And the idea of getting the white marking cloth, because that is what parcels are wrapped in, uh, the font. All of this is really an idea. And I remember when the photo department was being set up, and I was invited, the only time I was invited here to a meeting, I took the center letter box, and I put it on the table. And I said, you cannot shift the photography department away from NID. This is what I can do precisely because of all the different disciplines at NID. But I don't think anybody listened to me, and I wasn't invited back again. But for the students here, I would say that whatever possibility you get, I don't know if you can do internships in the textile department or the ceramic department, but the wealth that I have gathered is not just from visual communication. It's really from Aditi, from Ranjan, from Neela Mayer. You'll see the influence in the structures I make, in the bags that I make. So center letter was this little box that you could buy for 30 euros at that time. Um, and then I had the idea that I didn't like the way institutions or galleries showed photography. It's always a print on the wall, and that is not what I wanted. I felt my work was getting fossilized in these institutions. So I wanted to, I wanted to design a structure with which I could change the space. In a second, I could open it out, and I've disrupted the architecture of the room, and equally change the images in a second. And that's how I developed these museums. So this is Museum of Chance, and I think Center Letter just grew into Museum of Chance, because Museum of Chance also folds, folds in like an accordion. So this is Museum of Chance at the Hayward Gallery in London in 2013. And behind it is, I think, the Museum of Machines, Museum of Furniture, Museum of Vitrines. I made nine such museums, and together they formed Museum Bhavan. 
So now when I come to NID and I see the brown and the black, and those days when I was making this, people said, what is this brown and black combination? And I had also forgotten about NID, but I mean, look at the podium where I'm standing, you know? So there's, I think the materiality that got shaped in NID just has gone on to inform almost everything that I've done. And that's perhaps what sets me apart from other artists or other photographers, is this comfort that I have with m design and materiality. So maybe, I don't know, I don't even know what I would call myself. I keep changing it every day. But here's Museum of Chance at the retrospective. And if you look to the left, that center letter. And you have to believe me when I say that, of course, Museum of Chance holds the entire room. But so did center letter on par with each other. And that was, I was so happy that someday I hope I can have a major museum show like this one, but entirely with offset works. Because offset means numbers. So you print at least 500, if not 1,000, if not 3,000, if not 5,000. It means dissemination. It's going to go out in the world. You never know where it'll end up. And that's the aspect of photography I love even more than the image. The image, remember I said at the start, is the raw material for me. But what I love about photography is the dissemination and the different forms that can emerge for photography if photographers got out of the way. Photography is vast, but photographers have a way of keeping things in status quo. The photo festivals do that. The photo museums do that. Photo galleries do that. So it's really up to the photographer to say, no, I'm not going to toe that line, and I'm going to find my own form. Because I'm convinced photography is just filled with possibilities. It's us photographers who've sort of tried to box it in. So this is Museum of Chance again. And then, of course, there was the idea to make the Museum of Chance book. And this is when I said to Steidl, could I make a book with 88 different covers? And he said, absolutely not, because a book, the cover is the cover. And I said, no, Gerhard, I want to be able to have an exhibition of the book. And therefore, I need all the different covers, and I don't want to cut and paste myself, as I had done with File Room. So we, we always, we have a wonderful relationship. He gets very annoyed with me, and he says, absolutely not. This is ridiculous. And then the next day, he says, OK, we try it. And now, it's his favorite work because this is what we can do with it. So the MMK in Frankfurt wanted to have an exhibition. They just bought 88 copies of the book from Steidl and L clipped it onto the wall. At that time, I hadn't made the structures for it. So that's what the book can be. And if it's beautifully printed like Steidl does, to me, there is no reason to have the print. I know that. Uh, will disrupt the market, and that's possibly one of the reasons why the print has the position that it does. But now, especially now that I photograph in digital. See, earlier when we made negatives, then you made a print, you took it to the publisher, you could say that the negative was the original or the print was the original. I always said the negative was the original. But now that one is shooting digitally, who is to say what is the original? It's the same scan that my exhibition is printed with and the same scan that Steidl prints with. But guess what? I actually prefer Steidl's printing. The, it's closer to gravure, and that's the quality I like. So therefore, the Zakir Hussain maquette that I showed you earlier, that's it. That's the form. You can be the director of the Metropolitan Museum and say, I want to show your Zakir work. I will say, buy 44 books. And it's a win-win situation because after the exhibition, you sell the books. And the books even have a provenance. So you can sell it for more money if you want it. But the book can really replace the exhibition. Of course, when you have scale and you need the large prints, that's fine. So I'm not saying no to prints. I'm just saying give the book a chance as well, that there are many other forms possible for photography. So my way of doing this is by saying to people, there are no prints of my work now. You like the work, you buy a book object, or you buy a museum. So this is the first exhibition I had of the Museum of Chance book object at the Max Muller in Bombay. And I 
displayed it exactly as I would my silver prints and lit it in the same way because I wanted people to be confused and to say, why are we seeing a book? But the printing is so beautiful and I love the idea that even if this was framed, my entire symphony is at the back, you know? That it's not just this frame that has been taken away and hung separately on the wall. In fact, when I first started doing gallery exhibitions, I used to say to the gallerist, can I slip my book into the back of the frame? So the person who acquires it will know that there was a whole symphony, that they've only got one note. And that's when they said to me, Dainita, a book is a book, and an exhibition is an exhibition. And that was like my eureka moment. Like, OK, so now the book has to become the exhibition. And then, of course, very important to create a mahal around these situations so people could come and buy those book objects for 9,000 rupees. And I cannot tell you the privilege it was to be able to um, be like the first artwork in a young couple's house, you know? Some young couples came, they would together choose which book they wanted, which cover they wanted. Then I would wrap it for them in this white marquee again, beautifully finished at the edges. Um, this is, the st and I would stamp it. I think you can see for yourself the kind of materiality that I have been using again and again in my work. <clears throat> And then it was the same when I had to go to the Dhaka Art Summit. I built these little cubes. The books were put inside them. So the crates became the stools. The books were sold. So finally, there was no return shipping. And I made a lot of money. Same thing. I went to the Hava Mahal. I was invited to do something there. I put my books there. Um, and with the idea, you know, can the book be the exhibition itself? Still be true to the book. And this is my studio in Delhi, where I think Gurjeet and Komal will love this idea. I have these sliding walls. And for each book, I make these walls. So behind this is file room. And in front of it, the new book will come. So depending on which books I want to show you, I just move these walls. And this is what I love doing in my studio, rearranging the walls all the time. The joke is that I built so many moving walls in my studio that when I die, people won't be able to get to me because I will be stuck in my own labyrinth. Then I tell the art fair that we have to have more affordable art, relatively speaking, more affordable art. And so I get a booth at the art fair, and I sell these book objects. And by this time, those of you who know, uh, remember Neelam Ayer and the Javaja project will recognize the aesthetic of this bag and the furniture and the structure, I mean everything. And then I would sit there and make these sort of uh, individualizations for each person who acquired the work. And this was still being sold for 9,000 rupees with this wooden structure, so you could change the front and the back uh, and still look at the book whenever you wanted to. Then came the idea of making special bags for each book. So this is where I feel that my NID training is just constantly uh, by my side. You know, whether, whichever, especially when I'm going into some new direction. And that has been an incredibly um, shaping influence. You can, anybody here remembers Neela Meyer and the Javaja project? No? Yes. yes. So you recognize this aesthetic, no? And then, so this was a bookcase that I had made for those accordion fold books that you saw before. These. So you could buy a set, which was five of these books, <coughs> put it into the, <coughs> put it into that leather case, and go to the airport with it. So like you could come to the art fair and walk away with an artwork. And then I got ambitious, and I thought, let's make a suitcase. And so I made my suitcase museum, which for me is my favorite work from all my work. Mm, and I think it will be the most significant work. It may not be right now, but I believe that this is the future where you can carry your exhibition with you, then you sell the exhibition there. 
um, and come back with an empty suitcase or leave the suitcase for someone. And then guess what? The Sydney Biennale wanted to show my work. And I said, well, actually, I'm only showing the books now. So you would have to show four suitcases, because each suitcase has 22 books. The book had 88 covers, so I needed four suitcases. So four suitcases were shipped to Sydney and shown in the Biennale. And this is in the retrospective. This is my favorite room just uh, earlier this year. This is the offset room. And in this room, you see, you see that trolley at the end? That's a book cart that I have outside my house with my books. So if you come to visit and you say, oh, I don't have your books, A, you're not allowed in. Because I feel if you don't have my books, so I have a bookshop outside also, that if you don't have my books, then how much do you really care about my work and why should I bother engaging with you? And, but if you're a friend, then I would bring my book cart to you and say, you know, and we would make the exchange. Uh, on the wall is my jacket. And unfortunately, I don't have sent a letter, but I brought the jacket with me. We'll talk about that later. There's the file room bookcase on the table here. And here's the suitcase museum on this wall. And Kochi box on the wall. I won't get into that right now. So here's the suitcase museum. And the curators were told that they could keep changing front to back, left to right, as and when they felt like. So this is my manifesto for the museum. To me, the museum of the future is small and portable. It's organic and allows for change and growth continuously. It is a suitcase museum on wheels. It has ambassadors who transport it on flights and trains. The suitcases are the display as well as the storage units and must include a reserve collection. They may be affiliated to larger institutions such as Tate and take facsimiles from their collections or they are standalone like my museum bhavan. One could say they are pop-up museums that may be on show for an evening or an entire year. They have a PDF as a catalog which can be printed on demand. The ambassadors seek new venues for them in the places where they travel to and patrons to make an event for their opening. The museums of the future will need to reach a wider cross-section of people and not depend on those visiting them. So the suitcase museum. And to their credit, the Tate magazine actually published it in their, in their magazine. So here's Museum of Chance, my main museum among Museum Bhavan. The museums have their own furniture that fits inside the museum. And then there are, the museums also have these boxes which you see on the wall, which is my way of saying if you must so, show something on the wall, it should be in a box. And this museum was acquired by MoMA. And of course, I was delighted. This was the last museum to be acquired. I didn't want it to be ever acquired by anyone. And when my gallerist said, Dainita, you have to be absolutely sure that you don't want a museum to acquire this, I said, yeah, I mean, maybe if it's a t MoMA, then it's OK. And that's exactly what happened. MoMA asked for Museum of Chance, and they acquired Museum of Chance. It was a great opening. Uh, Glenn Lowry, the director, made this fantastic presentation at the opening. And I was in tears. I couldn't believe it because he said, I would like my Museum of Modern Art to be like this Museum of Chance, forever changing in its architecture and in its images. So it was a big moment for me. But I also realized that when museums acquire your work, they show them once, maybe twice, maybe thrice. So how are all of you going to see my museum, Bhavan, if they're all sitting in the storage of different museums? So I went back to Steidl, and I said, can we make a miniature museum, Bhavan? And he said, not again. And I said, yes, yes, yes. And we finally agreed. Except this time, I said, Gerhard, I don't want the same cover. I want 3,000 different covers. Because the problem with value in the book is that people say it's mass produced. So it doesn't have that value. So I said, well, what if I make it unique and mass produced? And Gerhard said, this is really now getting very too much for me. You handle it, and I'll pay for it. So I went to my friend Tepa, um, who had made sent a letter and various other objects for me. And I said, this time I want to make a box with 3,000 different covers. And I'll buy 3,000 pieces of khadi of different colors. And she said, it'll take you a year to find 3,000 pieces of different khadi. 
and depending, you know, they're not all of them are going to be. This is where the NID thing really comes in. Like, you know, what? How am I going to cover that fabric in book? How on the box? You know, how am I going to structure it? All of that. So. With Tepa, we realized that she had meters and meters of the achara fabric. Achara is the undercloth of block printing. So it's the residue of thousands of meters of ink. So no two centimeters are also the same, let alone the whole box. So we made 3,000 different boxes. But we didn't tell people that they were each unique boxes. So people bought them for. I think it was 5,000 rupees or 4,000, something like that, or some, I can't remember. Like they would buy a book, an expensive, very expensive book. And then when I met the librarian from MoMA, and I, I said, he said, we've got all your books in the library now. I said, fantastic. So where have you kept Museum Bhavan? And he said, oh, it's on the shelf, and we're very proud of it, and many people come and look at it. I said, but you do realize that it's a unique box that you have? And then there was confusion, because if it's unique, then it needs to go into the art storage. And I said, no, no, it's fine. You can leave it, because you can you know, replace it. It's not irreplaceable, but you'll just get a very different box. So that became a very important thing for me. And I went back to Satram Das Jola in 2018, took out center letter, and put Museum Bhavan in. So imagine the footfalls that Satram Das Jola has given me over 10 years versus any other museum show. And then, of course, more suitcases were made. This is at the Museum of Innocence in Istanbul, Pamuk's museum, where I had the first book release of my, um, and this is a very interesting Instagram story, because I was very influenced by Museum of Innocence. And so I wanted to have the first book release um, in Istanbul at his museum. And he said, yes, of course, it would be a pleasure. Why don't we do it at the time of the Istanbul Biennale? And so, so I arrived there, and just an hour or two before the opening of the exhibition, put, found some benches, covered the, you know, made my own sort of vitrines, and sat there with my uh, translator and the curator. And 5 became 5.30, became 6.30, became 7. There were two tables full of wine glasses, one table all red wine, one table all white wine, and Orhan Pamuk's beautiful message playing on the wall, how we are both storytellers. It was a great moment for me. And so I posted and made these pictures and said, great to be at Museum of Innocence, inaugurating Museum Bhavan. But guess what? Nobody came. Because the museum thought Biennale was going to invite, and Biennale thought the museum was going to invite. So we had this opening. On my Instagram page and all my books, you'll see I did open an exhibition at Museum of Innocence, but nobody came. So that's also interesting for me, no? With Instagram, you can make something out of whatever you want. And then a friend wanted to have a very special date with his partner. And so they went to the Agra, and then he had an opening of my museum with the Taj Mahal at the back. So this was the great uh, privilege for me that people would take my work and do what they liked with it. And so when Serendipity said, we'd like to show your work, I said, sure, coming up, here's the book. And to their credit, they built me this beautiful little room. So you could feel like you were entering a museum, but it was actually all books. So this was, I think, 2018. And this is the famous nine pocket jacket, because then I thought, you know, sometimes you never know. Why don't I just take it out and put it on? And you can imagine what I used to do. So that's the jacket. It has these nine pockets. And if we had the center letter here, I would have put it into these pockets. Um, and at the back, you can see, it says, my life as a museum. And so I become the museum myself. And the museum can travel wherever I go. So if I want to go to, what is the salad place behind NID? Tilly or something? Tilla. So I'll go to Tilla, and I can have an exhibition there, provided I had the books. So you know, it's like dissemination was one thing, but then to take charge 
of how these exhibitions are going to happen, where they're going to happen. And no other medium really allows this in the way that photography does. So which is why I get a little impatient with prints on the wall and so on. So that's me in Venice with the jacket becoming the vitrine myself. And of course, many people think you're trying to sell something, though they say sort of, no, no, no. And some people get quite interested, and then they look at the work, and they want the book, and I tell them, sorry, it's not for sale, because it's out of print now. Um, and finally, here's dancing with my camera. And this, to me, is like a really a culmination of uh, well, not a culmination, but it, it brings in, it's, it's the catalog for my exhibition at the Gropius Bau, the retrospective, which is now going to travel for another two years. Rukmani Guha Thakurda worked on the design for it, uh, the finest book designer we have. And Kajri Jain wrote what I said to you right in the beginning, what I think is the most uh, critical essay on my work. Um, and she called it Photography Beyond the Photograph, Dayanita Singh's Theory of Photography. So I brought 40 copies with me, and they're for sale outside, but they're only available to students, so you have to show your ID. Uh, the MRP is 3,500 rupees, but for the students, it's 500 rupees. Mm, and I would uh, urge even the ones who can afford to pay the 3,500, maybe you can get it somewhere else. So just give the students a chance. And this was, this was my main reason for coming here. I really wanted to talk about critical writing and to talk to the students to say that unless we can develop critical writing for photography, I've done, I haven't shown you everything, but I've shown you quite a span of what I've been able to do. But at a certain point, you are really starved for critical writing because you don't know where you're landing. Um, you don't know how it is being received. And I've done this now since sent a letter, so you could say it's been 15 years trying to make the book into an object, into the exhibition, which I think is something quite interesting for photography. But we haven't had any writing. And so with this catalog, we wanted to change that. So there's this. Um, wonderful essay by Stephanie Rosenthal, the curator of this exhibition, but she was also the curator of my exhibition at the Hayward Gallery. Oh, and there's a very interesting story with dancing with my camera, because I usually, I used to use a Hasselblad till I used film, and so I had said to Stephanie that I would like to call the exhibition Dancing with my Hasselblad, because I felt that with an eye camera, you're like this, and it's a certain way of seeing. But when you have the camera against your belly, I can't hold it and still hear me. <laughs> so if you have the camera here, you have to really do like a belly dance to get the image that you want. And plus you keep the eye contact. So this was really important to me, and I wanted to do a workshop mm, at Serendipity called Dancing with My Camera, and I had the audacity to invite Mark Morris, who was like the greatest, one of the greatest dance choreographers, to say, can we do this workshop together? Because I want to teach pe people how to dance with the camera. So the, it's on my blog, so that you can check it out. It's called Dancing with My Hasselblad. And so I told the curator, I'd like to call the retrospective Dancing with My Hasselblad. And she said, I don't think we can call it Dancing with My Hasselblad, because not everybody knows what a Hasselblad is. Besides, it might sound like a promo, you know? So it'll be, they might sue us, or people will think they've given us all this money. And guess what? A month later, I got a call from Hasselblad. And by that time, we had already decided on dancing with my camera, so we couldn't change it. But I thought that was an interesting chance situation that happened. And now, I'll just run you through the essays. So there's Stephanie's essay, the lead essay, Dancing with my ca Camera. 
Teju Cole, who I'm sure many of you know, who's one of the finest writers alive, and anyone interested in photography should be reading everything that he writes, or interested in the image, you know, we should stop thinking of it just as photography. This is a very interesting essay by Ahuna Pal Chaudhary. It's on the influence of Indian classical music on my work. And here is where I come back to the idea of how do we build critical writing in photography here? Because somebody sitting in New York that has not really grown up in this culture of Indian classical music is not going to be able to write this essay. It had to be someone from here. And even though I'm always saying I don't want to be described by my gender or geography and all of that, I realize there are some things, like I think for someone to write about my work, they really, and Rukmini has done that in another book, they have to really look at NID. So Rukmini has written about the influence of NID on my work. But you know, that's, there's one Rukmini and one Kajri, and that's it, and one Ohna. And I don't know how many other essays this kind of critical writing we've had for photography in the region. We always get anecdotal essays or, you know, where they talk about why you did something, how you did it. But, you know, I can write that on my own. So what are we going to do about critical writing is the question I want to leave all of you with. And this is Kajri Jain's absolutely brilliant essay. Um, where she talks about the influence of the bazaar on my work and the politics of the economy of the bazaar on my work. And then, of course, in many other directions. So I would really urge students to go down and find those 500 rupees somewhere. Just don't smoke for a month. Um, and get the book. It's a bit. It's a bit awkward for me to be saying this as it's a book about my work, but just put me aside and let's just look at this writing and see how are we going to build on this? How is there going to be more critical writing in this direction where we are really, really dissecting the work of an artist? I don't think we've had it in photography in the region. So with that, I think, I can, we can close, and I would invite you all to come down. So I think my mother was online. And sure, sure. So we are open for the question and also thing. Hi, so we are open for the question and answer thing now. If you have any question you want to ask, please raise your hand. Ask, ask, I'm not as fierce as I used to be. I promise. Thank you so much, Dayanita, for the wonderful presentation. I would like to ask that, uh, as you said, the consciousness to the camera is day by day increasing, and people are not uh, as they are, their real self in front of the camera. So how do you like make the subject comfortable around the camera so that they, their raw self is in the photographs? Well, in a way, I think people are always conscious of the camera. At that time, they knew I was there with the camera. What has happened, meanwhile, is that photography has got so connected with surveillance, no? So now, when even if you're photographing me, I, I'm safer if you're photographing me with a film camera, right? Because that's just a negative. But the moment you photograph me with your phone, I don't know where I'm being archived and under what category. So there is an unease with the image with people, I think, with all people. You can't be comfortable. And in that situation, I would say to play up on that, to exaggerate that, and to maybe think of something more theatrical, uh, something that is more drama. I mean, my family portraits anyway ended up being like that because for other reasons. Did I answer your question? Yeah. 
या बट समवेयर लाइक पीपल से दे लाइक फोटो पाड़ो और पाड़ो एंड ऑन दी अदर साइड दे आर लाइक स्टॉप सो हाउ डू यू डील विद दैट आई थिंक एज अ फोटोग्राफर यू बिल्ड अप अ फैंटास्टिक सिक्स सेंस एंड यू कैन रियली इवन विदाउट आई कैन टेल फ्रॉम समन आईज whether they're okay being photographed or not i don't even have to wait to ask them or for them to say no to me you know we get into a problem when you're with another class because there there is terror at being photographed um and there is no power to say don't take my picture so from the beginning not from the beginning after i worked as a photojournalist for 2 years and i saw the inequality in this in this relationship that's when i stopped doing photojournalism but and i started to make family portraits or say the work with mona also i knew that photography has to be a collaboration i can't make photo, photos of people um just like that it's like asking them and then in, in to answer your question quite sort of clearly then it's just it takes time you know like if you're photographing a building it takes time for the building to reveal itself to you i've been doing that in the past week and it's been exactly like that you know it's about the light but it's also about listening to the building and i think as photographers we forget about this so i like to say that mera kaan bahut pakka hai i can, i listen very well whether it's to a space or a person or an edit or a series of images so then if you just take the time that people will relax and provided they can trust you and that is something i don't know how to teach but it has to do with your intention so if your intention is clear people are people pick up on that thank you so much thank you danta uh, i want to ask what was the relation of uh, train sound in your first video ah mona because she used to live by the train track all right okay. thank you so it was a continuous sound um yeah okay. thank you so we just exaggerated it but something went wrong with the sound at some point i don't know what i i'd never seen it projected Ah uh, very interesting yeah i don't know i can't give you that answer <laughs> each person has to work that out for themselves in my case i can just say that i always know but i've had 40 years experience now so you know if somebody tells me this is and it always happens when you do a new work it's like what is this why have you put the gutter in the middle you know when you do blue book they say why aren't you making black and white prints so everybody wants you to stay with the familiar because everyone likes to remain in that in that box of familiar so every time you do something new there's always people telling you how um awful it is or how you you're crazy you're losing it because the earlier work was so much better that i never pay attention to but you understand if someone is telling me that you know if you're talking about a novel then what is this or what is that I I would take that on but I arrive at things quite slowly so it's not like idea aa gaya to novel bana di so I trust in that process and I've trusted in that process ever since I started to get independent from the gallery and the institute institutions etc and photography and photo festivals and it has never let me down So this is how I work this is how I also create my images I have a sense that this is something I want to photograph what will come out of it I don't know because I have to listen to the images and then I trust in that process but you have to be ready to fail all the time 
You know, it's part of being an artist. You think you've tried something and it maybe it just doesn't work. You don't know it. I mean, I'm always a little nervous before anything. So even this lecture, which, you know, you're, you don't sleep that well the night before because you're thinking how you want to tell the story. Uh, there are friends here who were at my Canoria lecture. I don't want them to feel that it's repetitive. It's NID. So there's lots of things going on. So I think finally it's about finding your voice and then trusting that voice. And if at all you have to, in the beginning, I would say the best advice was be careful who you listen to. Choose those people carefully because you can't listen to praise from one and criticism from another. So you choose those people and you listen to them completely. Walter Keller was such a person for me. Gerhard Steidel is also like that. But beyond that, I really trust the process. <laughs> it's no answer, but you'll figure it out. Uh, hi, Danita. Thanks hi. for the presentation. So I wanted to ask you a little bit um, about the relationship between the text and the image mm. and how you arrive at that. Um, because I think when we talk about Im images or like you know, visual expression, using words or text or voiceover of any kind, dialogues, it's really criticized a lot, you know? It's like it's not the pure way of expressing. But being a person who, whose strength is perhaps using words, um, how do you navigate through that, you know? Kind of coming to a middle ground. Mm. First of all, I would say just forget all these things that you are told about pure is this and pure is that and you know photography is wide open it is vast you make of it what you want to make of it and these clubs get formed and then there's a certain way of looking at photography you have to really work out your own relationship with the medium first of all text I think is a beautiful way of expressing things so I call this a photo novel but it has no words I mean, it has no text words, because I believe that photographs can go where there are no words, where there is no vocabulary. That's a strength of photography. So I make a photo novel. But there's a contradiction there, because I'm calling it a novel. But there is no text, and I'm saying the image should be the text. This is one extreme. And I've been someone who's always been against using captions and all of that. But I feel that. If you can work out a great balance uh, with a writer, and it's rare. I had that with Avik Sen in House of Love. And I said to him, I'll book, make a book of short stories. So I'll do what the image does. I'll do what text does. And you make a text which is uh, like what images do. So that was an experiment. I don't know whether we succeeded or not. But this question of text and image is very important. And the next six books I'm making have a lot of text in them. Because now that I'm thinking of the archive, I'm also thinking that I really want to have something very solid in the book. Uh, the images are solid in themselves. But if I can add another layer, because Homi Baba is going to write about time measures, then why not? Make it something substantial. Um, so I think it's something worth thinking about. The problem with text is the design. You really need someone like Rukmini Guha Thakurda to be working on the design of it. Because that is a skill. I don't know if, how much of uh, InDesign you learn or book design you learn in the photography course. But book design is like a field in itself. So much as I would say you have to make your maquettes and your dummies and you have to make them again, break them, tear them apart, start again, you also have to uh, finally work with a designer. So the font you use, the size you use, where you place the text makes such a big difference to the image, as well as the overall experience of the book. But I think now we can go back to thinking much more about using text and image. That time maybe is over of when it should be only the pure image and we don't need text with it. As long as the text can add another layer to it. So obviously, we don't want illustrative text. But if it can add another layer, why not? 
Thank you. Thank you, Dhanita. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could tell us more about uh, images and the relation that they have with the media they're represented on. For example, in your work, you have a photo novel, you have a film, you have a exhibition. And how do we make that decision as to how those images should be represented? I don't know if I can explain this to you. I've been trying to explain it. It never quite comes out right. I don't think we make the decision. I think the images make the decision. And that's where I would say, think about the idea of listening to images. So what I do when I work is I have long tables, hundreds of images on the table. I have some idea I may want to make a book, but I look at the images and it's like, no, this is not a book. This is a projection or this is just a triptych, that's it. You have to be willing to discard 300 photos or 3,000 photos. So that is the skill that you build up slowly and it's wonderful when you get to it. I've just done so much photography in this week, one week here. And it'll, t it'll be a long process before I do something with it because I don't know what the images will lead me to. And so the images can be your guide. And then there are different levels of forms, no? So for me, often the book is the first form. And then there's an exhibition. But then there might be a video. There might be a projection. There might be flyers. There might be a suitcase. Um, so it keeps expanding. But I feel the images are quite powerful and will tell you what they want to be. Thank you. And to not come at them with a pre-prescribed idea, you know, which we say, oh, I'm going to make a book and I'm, or I'm going to make a projection. That's a problem, I feel.